So take a few moments to take a look at your mind and there might be thoughts in the mind about later today. Some of you will be, will be leaving and you might already be thinking about what you're going to do when you go home and so on. So you're, you're not there yet. We're still in the morning and this is our last uh, teaching for the weekend. So really try to put aside any other thoughts there may be in your mind that aren't related to what we are doing here so that you can really focus fully on this last teaching. And let's also see if we can generate a really positive motivation for listening, participating in this course. So the best motivation that we can have is altruism. Um, we use the term bodhicitta in Mahayana Buddhism, which is well, the full, full meaning of bodhicitta is wanting to become a Buddha in order to benefit all living beings. That's a pretty high goal, and some of you may not feel ready to aspire for that, feel convinced that that's something you can do and wish to do. But if in that case, you, you can probably just feel the sense of wanting to help others as much as you can, wanting to benefit other people, other beings, wanting to benefit the world, to bring more positive energy into the world. So that's a form of altruism too, having the wish to help others rather than being 100% focused on just your own well-being. So just take a few moments to, to generate such thoughts and feelings in whatever way works for you. For example, just thinking, I'm here to listen to these teachings so I can become a more kind person, more helpful to others, the people I meet, people I work with, my family, my friends, and as many other beings as possible. So yesterday afternoon, we started to go through some verses from a text by Nagarjuna, one of the great Indian masters. And in this text, he's uh, sharing some methods on how to have more fondness for sentient beings. And so we looked at one verse yesterday, and now we'll look at a few more. Yeah, so the text is called Tale of a Wish-Fulfilling Dream. So these verses are related to um, the Buddhist explanation, uh, some Buddhist explanations about our existence, our world, our situation, uh, which we call samsara. Um, this is kind of the situation of those of us who are not yet enlightened, not yet awakened. So we're in samsara, and it's characterized by um, suffering and unsatisfactoriness and problems, delusions or afflictive emotions and karma and so on. So lots of problems, lots of troubles in samsara. And samsara also includes uh, rebirth or reincarnation. It's not just this one life, which is what a lot of people believe in. We just have this one life, and then we die, and then that's it. There's nothing after that. Uh, so Buddha definitely did teach rebirth. And not only that, but <laughs> he said um, there's no beginning to it all. It didn't start at a certain point in time. And there's no creator who brought it all into existence. So it's quite a different story than probably many of us were brought up with. 
So just a quotation from one sutra in the Pali tradition. So these are the words of the Buddha. From an inconceivable beginning comes the wandering on. A beginning point is not discernible. Though beings hindered by ignorance and fettered by craving are transmigrating and wandering on. So sentient beings, that means beings who are not Buddhas, not enlightened, um, we go through this cycle of being born and living, dying, and then again being born and living and dying. And so it's like a cycle, like a Ferris wheel or a merry-go-round, although it's not very merry, it's pretty <laughs> miserable. <laughs> If you were tied up on a merry-go-round and it just kept going around and around and around and you couldn't get off, it would be pretty unpleasant. <laughs> so it's a bit like that. Some is like that. We're just stuck. And we're not stuck by any external forces, but by our own ignorance and other afflictions and our karma. That's what keeps us stuck in samsara. But fortunately, there is a way out. And the Buddha found a way out, because he used to be in samsara too, but he found a way out. And so then he taught it so that those of us who also want to get out can do so. Yeah, so if any of you listening to this have difficulty accepting the Buddhist explanation of rebirth, um, it could be helpful to ask yourself, why? Why do I have this difficulty? And, and even write, write them down. You know, write down your reasons why you have difficulty Uh, accepting rebirth. So make a list of your reasons and then look at those reasons and ask yourself if they are really kind of solid, foolproof reasons for not believing in rebirth. It can be quite helpful because often we don't really think that way. We just go along with what we've learned or what we feel but never really look at that and ask, is that really a valid reason (laughs) for not believing? Especially, you know, this was taught by the Buddha, and so if we do have respect for the Buddha, I mean, surely we we find certain things that the Buddha taught are true, and we can accept them, we can see them as true, and they're useful, they're beneficial. So if some of the things that he taught are true, then what about rebirth? You know, was he just inventing that? Um, was he lying to us? You know, why did the Buddha teach rebirth if it wasn't the case, if it wasn't true? Um, yeah, so it's good to look at reasons that we may have. So just as an example, one reason somebody might have would be, well, most of the people I know don't believe in it. <laughs> and this could be quite true. But just because a lot of people believe something, does that mean it, it's true? Like there were, I, I heard there's millions of people who believe that Donald Trump won the last election. But does that make it true? <laughs> they wish to. They wish it was true. But yeah. And then most people, the vast majority of people on this planet, believe that they have a real solid I that's in control of everything. And. Um, they don't doubt that. They don't have any doubt about the existence of that I because it feels like it's there. But just because billions of people believe in it, does that make it true? Yeah, so just going along with what a lot of other people believe isn't a good reason to believe something. Another reason people often have is, well, I don't remember any past lives. Do you remember everything you did in this lifetime? <laughs> Do you remember coming out of your mother's womb? <laughs> so there's a lot of things even in this life we don't remember. But does that make does that is that a reason to say, oh, it didn't happen because I don't remember it? Yeah. So that could be helpful just to explore your reasons for not believing or having difficulty believing, and then and then you know it, it can also be good to write down lists of reasons in support of rebirth. Um, you might need to do some research to do this, but there is material. There's the Buddha's teachings. The Buddha taught it, and it's also found in a lot of other ancient um, traditions, cultures. Even early Christians believed in rebirth. It was kind of banned at a certain point by one of the 
Christian councils, they threw that one out. But early Christians <laughs> did believe in it. <laughs> and, um, and also Judaism. It's not so well known, but I've heard from, from some Jewish friends that it is there. So there are a number of religions that do have this idea of rebirth. And then there's lots of people who remember past lives, and um, it's good to read about those. One professor, he passed away a few years ago, but he spent 40 years of his life. He was a um, professor of psychology, I think, and he was also a psychiatrist, so he was a man of science. Ian Stevenson, and he spent many, many years collecting stories of people, mostly children, who remember past lives. And he was very thorough in his investigation. You know, he talked to the child, he talked to their parents, other family members, neighbors, you know, just try to get as much information as possible. Then he would look to see if there really was a person that the child spoke about being, you know, the, the reincarnation of. And in many cases, he did find there was such a person and the information the child had could be verified. So he has thousands of these cases, and there's one book called 20 Cases uh, Suggestive of Reincarnation, where he shared some of these cases, the most convincing ones. And he passed away, but one of, uh, one of his colleagues, Jim Tucker, has carried on the work and is continuing to collect these cases and write books about them and so on. So you can go online and, and find out that information. And... Um, Another source of another yeah area that could help us be a more open to rebirth is near death experiences. So again, there's a lot of people doing research research on that. One of the one is a Dutch cardiologist Pim van Lommel, um, who got interested in this because some of his patients that he brought back after cardiac arrest. Um, were talking about experiences they had while they were dead, you know, no sign of life, heart not working, brain not working, and yet they came back to life and they talked about experiences that they had during that period of time when they were supposedly dead, their brain was dead, should have not been functioning and producing any thoughts or experiences, but they did have experiences. So he got so interested in this that he, you know, spent 15 years doing research, doing studies and research, and published his his um, his findings. And there's others as well, other doctors, especially doctors, I think, because they have firsthand experience of this. So those who, you know, the scientists who say, oh, no, no, it's impossible, uh, consciousness, all our conscious experiences are just produced by the brain, they can't explain this kind of thing, how, how the brain is able to produce consciousness when it's not functioning, when it's dead. So they can't explain that. So there's actually a lot of material that goes against this materialistic view that consciousness, awareness, experiences are only produced by the brain. So if you look into it, you will find a lot of, of material, and, and that really helps. It helped me. Um, I didn't have too much trouble believing the rebirth when I first encountered it, but I was still skeptical. But I, when I read Ian Stevenson's book, um, I just felt there can be no other explanation <laughs> for this kind of phenomena. So that can be helpful to explore that. And try to at least keep an open mind. Don't close the door. Um, even if you have doubt, that's fine to have doubt. The Buddha said we should explore and investigate and not just blindly believe something because other people say so. At least try to keep an open mind and think, maybe it's true. Maybe there is rebirth. And you don't have to believe in rebirth in order to be a kind person. <laughs> but it does help especially when it comes to really difficult people, people who are doing horrible things. And you might think, this person doesn't deserve kindness. They're not being kind themselves, so why should I be kind to them? Um, But there are reasons for being kind to that person, for having an open heart, kindness and compassion uh, for that person. And accepting rebirth will help with that, as we'll see in the next couple of verses. So, so the next verse says, 
uh, together with these beings, I experienced the sufferings of the unfortunate realms and all sorts of happiness of the higher realms. Since we dwelt as one, I am fond of them. So not only did the Buddha teach rebirth, but he also taught the existence of different realms where we can take rebirth. So it isn't the case that we're always human beings every life. Um, There are other places where we could be reborn. And some of these are unfortunate uh, places where there's a lot of suffering and deprivation. Animal realm is one of those. So if we really, you know, study the lives of animals, it becomes very clear that they have more suffering than we do on for the most part. I mean, there's exceptions like, you know, somebody's pet poodle who gets pampered and li- has a better life than a lot of human beings <laughs> in one way, physically better. But in another way, <laughs> mentally, you know, the, the, the state of mind of an animal is, is, is not able to Um, grow, to develop very far. And so if you try to teach dharma to an animal, we've tried, haven't we? (laughs) The the abbey cats. But they just don't understand it. They just don't get it. You know, like we tell them, don't kill. You know, it's not good to kill. Those little chipmunks and little mice, they want to live too. They don't want to die, but they just don't get it. So that's why we have to keep them inside, (laughs) unless they're on a leash. Yeah, so animals, the minds of animals, the brains of animals, aren't capable of understanding the Dharma and practicing the Dharma, whereas the minds of human beings can. So even an impoverished human being, a human being living in really, you know, great difficulties, will still be able to understand and practice the Dharma. So that's, yeah, one way that certain rebirths are unfortunate, because not being able to understand and practice the Dharma. And then there's other places that are worse than the animal realm. (laughs) There's hell in Buddhism. And these places of rebirth, they, there's no external force that sends us there. That's one thing you have to be clear about. It's our own karma. And, And in fact, Shantideva says, it is our own mind that creates those realms. Those realms are created by our own mind. When our mind is so caught up in negativity, like anger and hatred and aggressiveness and violence, and and then we act out those those mental states and do awful things. So those factors within our own mind are what cause this rebirth in an unfortunate state. Okay, so it's all up to ourselves to. Um, make sure we don't create the causes to go to these unfortunate realms. But anyway, um, and then there's fortunate realms. So there's the human realm, this is considered a fortunate one, and then there's heavenly realms. There's actually lots of god realms or heavens in Buddhism, and they get better and better the higher you go. And those are also the result of our own mental states and our karma, particularly virtuous karma, and also... De- you know, developing concentrated state of mind, a mind that is able to stay focused on whatever object we're focusing on, a virtuous object, and then being able to put aside distracting thoughts and disturbing emotions and so on. So developing really good concentration is the main cause for some of the higher uh, god realms or heavenly realms. So it's, it's those result from a very pure, purified state of mind. Um, yeah, so all these different realms and different rebirths and different experiences that we have within samsara are the result of our own mental states and our karma, the actions that we do. This is a big topic. We don't have time to go into it, but it's, it's there. The information is there if you're interested. So what Nagarjuna is saying here is, okay, we've had all these past lives, and we haven't always been in the same place but we've been all throughout samsara and all the different realms of samsara. We've been in the unfortunate realms and we've had terrible, terrible sufferings there. And we've also been in the higher realms, the God realms, and had incredible happiness there. And we've, um, we've been together with all other sentient beings in these different situations. 
Okay, we haven't just been all by ourselves, but we've been surrounded by other beings. When we were in unfortunate states and suffering, miserable, there have been other beings there with us who also suffered and were miserable. When we've been in the God realms, the heavenly realms, or the human realm, again, we've been together with many other beings. And so it's a bit like a salad, you know, all these different (laughs) bits of lettuce and other vegetables just all tossed together. So we and all other (laughs) Indian beings, you know, are just tossed around in in samsara and all these different realms. So contemplating that, he says, since we dwelt as one, I am fond of them. And so I was thinking maybe we could compare it to experiences we had in this life. If if you have been through certain very intense experiences, both maybe, you know, scary ones, painful ones, difficult ones, as well as wonderful experiences. So if you share those experiences with other people, then you can feel quite close to them, like bonding. They'd say bonding. You bond when you experience things together. And then um, that causes us to feel close with with those people and when we get when we meet again you know oh you know so we're really happy to see each other and then we you know uh, share our memories our stories and oh that was like this and that was like that so yeah sharing experiences together especially really exciting wonderful ones or really scary painful ones uh, bring us close to other people so if we, if we extend that as Nagarjuna is doing and think well this is the case with Everybody, you know, I have been with all of these people, all of these beings in all these different realms and had all these different experiences. And, and thinking in that way can um, bring us together, make us feel closer to others. So, yeah, most people don't remember their past lives. But what if we did? What if we had that I mean, they do say it's possible. The memories of all our past lives are there. We just don't have access to them because our mind is so preoccupied with this life and we haven't developed our mind very far. But they say with the development of concentration, when you, when you gain stronger concentration, it's kind of like opening up your mind to all those memories. You know? So with higher levels of concentration... I mean, this is what happened to the Buddha in the story of the eve of his enlightenment. The night that he attained enlightenment, he sat down and went into a state of samadhi, of concentration, and then, you know, went into his past lives. And he remembered all his previous lives and all his connections with other people, other beings. We don't have to be a Buddha to do that. It, it, it can happen even before Buddhahood. But it is possible. And that would be quite an extraordinary experience to have. Like if you looked around this room and you could remember, oh yeah, that was my brother, that was my sister, that was my husband, my wife, my child, my mother. We had all these good times together and all these bad times together. And so it really (laughs) make us feel close rather than these people are strangers. In fact, there's no such thing as a stranger. No such thing as a stranger. We've known each other before many times, not just once, but again and again. And so, yeah, even though we can't have a direct experience of that, good to try to at least keep an open mind and consider it's possible. Then the next verse says, "Uh, Not just once did I reside in every womb, nor is there a single sentient being who did not reside in my womb. Therefore, we are all family. So the Buddha, in in the same sutra that I read from before, uh, went on to say, it's difficult to find anybody who has not been your mother, who has not been your father, who has not been your brother, your sister, your son, your daughter. Yeah. So if the Buddha can't find that, <laughs> then probably hard for us to do so. And so picking up on that thing, Nagarjuna is saying, 
that I have been in the womb of every other living being. In other words, they have been my mother. And so yesterday we talked a little bit about the kindness of the mother and what the mother does for us. I mainly spoke about what she does after we are born, but it's also good to consider uh, what she did before we were born. You know, she sort of gave her body uh, for our our tiny little um, zygote, I think it's called, fertilized egg, you know, to be implanted in there and then start to grow nourished by her body. And it's not an easy experience. I don't have it firsthand, but, you know, it can be painful, pain, discomfort, and inconvenience, and... um, Maybe some embarrassment about how you look, you know, <laughs> the clothes you have to wear, and, and so on. And my mother, one thing she said was that uh, the doctor order, or advised her to eat yogurt, that that, was, that would be a good thing for her, or for the child, and she hated yogurt. <laughs> but she forced herself to eat yogurt, just for her babies, you know, to, to do what's good for her baby. So this is how mothers are, you know, they're, they're putting the, the baby first, thinking of what will be beneficial for them and adjusting, making these adjustments in their own lifestyle for the baby. And so that's really good to contemplate as well, what our mother did for us before we were born. <laughs> and then while we were born, coming out of the womb, which must be one of the most painful experiences there is, and it can go on for hours, even days. Whew, <laughs> scary. <laughs> um, yeah, so, so uh, every being, th- so this is part of that meditation, every being has played that role for me, you know, has... Um, allowed me to be in their womb and given birth to me and then took care of me when I was small and helpless. And and not just as human beings, you know, and even in other uh, forms of being as well, like animals. So it's also good to observe animal mothers and how they take care of their babies. Um, there was one experience here last year or the year before. It was quite amazing we were having breakfast, and it was, I guess, summertime when the mother turkeys were going around with their babies. And there was one mother out there with, I don't know, 10 or 11 little chicks. And suddenly the sky turned dark, and then thunder, and this incredible downpour of rain coming down. And the mother opened her wings, and all the little babies went under her wings. And then she just sat there you know, the rain pouring down on her, protecting her babies until the until the rain stopped. And I don't think turkeys like being rained on because I've observed them when it starts to rain, they run for the shelter. <laughs> but, you know, she put up with that rain for her babies, for her little ones. Really, really touching. So just to see examples of the kindness of mothers and then contemplate you know, every sentient being has done that for my sake. Who? So, um, very powerful way to open up our hearts. Although it is hard to really <laughs> accept that every single being has been our mother. Very hard. They actually say that's one of the most difficult meditations. Not easy, even for the Tibetans who do believe in rebirth and. And they also, in many of their prayers, they have this expression, Ma Sem Chen, which means mother sentient beings. So if they're reciting prayers every day, they may say those words, you know, for the sake of all mother sentient beings, I will become a Buddha. So even repeating that phrase every day, it probably helps to get more of a sense of every being having been one's mother, but still quite hard (laughs) to really accept it. But even just to think, Maybe it's true. Maybe this turkey has been my mother. Maybe this mosquito has been my mother. Maybe this annoying person has been my mother. It can really help to open our hearts and not cling to feelings of anger and annoyance. Also, one time um, I was attending a teaching with one of my teachers, um, uh, Kensu Jamatekchok, 
And he threw out this question to us. He said, why do the Buddhas have compassion for all sentient beings? It seemed like a pretty simple question, and we were just throwing, you know, answering. He wasn't satisfied with any of the answers that we gave. (laughs) Finally, (laughs) we ran out of ideas, and he said, I'll tell you why. He said it's because the Buddhas have direct uh, memory of the kindness that they have received from each and every sentient being. They can remember that. Because the Buddha's mind sees everything, like totally open, totally pure. So a Buddha can remember every single experience they've ever had, and they're able to identify. Oh, in that life, this person was my mother, and in that life, that person was my mother. So they can remember having been the child of every single sentient being and remember what that sentient being did for them when they were mothers. And not just mothers, but all kinds of other ways as well. Fathers and teachers and doctors and nurses and providers of food and clothes and so on and so forth. So the Buddha is able to see all of that. He can see each and every one of us and see, oh yeah, you were my mother and you were my father and you were the farmer that made the food that I ate and da-da-da-da-da. <laughs> so having that, it was just kind of mind-blowing to think about that. Having that direct experience, that direct memory of what other beings have done for oneself, you can't help but feel kindness and compassion and the wish to repay their kindness, just like with our mother of this lifetime. If we are really aware, really open to what she has done for us, then we can't help. Nobody has to tell us, you should be nice to your mother. You should take care of your mother when she needs you. Nobody has to tell us that. We just know that's what we have to do. If our mother was in a house that was burning and she was trapped and she couldn't get out, we wouldn't say, oh, I have to go to work, or I'm going to the swimming pool. (laughs) You know, we would just drop everything and immediately go and do whatever we could to get her out of that burning house. So it's like that with the Buddhas and the Bodhisattvas, you know, they they see all of us as having been kind to them, and they see us stuck in this horrible burning house of samsara. And so they're just totally, 100%, uh, dedicated to helping us get out. So that's where we can go to with this kind of reflection. Yeah, everyone has been our mother. Also, this is unusual, but the Buddha did say everybody has been our son and a daughter as well. So to think that every sentient being has been in my womb. (laughs) So that's quite a switch, you know, especially Nagarjuna being a male, to actually think, well, I have been a female in past lives, and I have been a mother, and I carried every single sentient being in my womb and gave birth to them and took care of them when they were small and helpless. And so I think that's really beautiful as well, too, to think that not only has every being been our mother, but they've also been our child. And that means we loved them. We had this incredible, intense love for each and every living being. We had that feeling before. So if we had it before, we can have it again. We can remember and revive that feeling of, you know, the mother for her child. So that would be quite extraordinary. And so then, yeah, again, he concludes, we are all family. This is kind of a more powerful reason to think of how we are all family rather than just, you know, we all want to be happy and don't want to suffer. I mean, that's a good reason as well. But this is going even deeper. So it's not easy, like I say, it's not easy to be really convinced of this. But Buddha did say it. (laughs) So why did the Buddha say it? (laughs) Was he just, you know, making up something to make us feel good? I tend to think he was talking from first-hand experience. He knew what he was talking about. And we can verify it for ourselves If we're willing to put that time and energy into developing concentration, then we can come to the point where we will be able to have our own first-hand experience of of this idea.
Okay, so then we got two more verses. Okay, the next one says uh, further, I am fond of the Buddha as he worked hard for the sake of these sentient beings for a very long time. That too makes me fond of sentient beings. So Nagarjuna is saying here that he's fond of the Buddha. He has respect. He probably has immense devotion and respect for the Buddha. And he's thinking about how the Buddha, uh, like what we say in Buddhism, you know, becoming a Buddha, you have to work for many, many lifetimes. You have to cultivate love and compassion and then practice generosity and ethics and patience, the six perfections, for many, 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 many lifetimes building up the necessary uh, merit to reach enlightenment. And so the Buddha, it said, he spent three countless great eons, (laughs) I don't know how many lifetimes that is, but a huge number of lifetimes, life after life after life, cultivating these qualities and doing these practices and um, creating the causes to become a Buddha. So he didn't just do it in one lifetime. It was a long, long, long time. And what motivated him to do all of that work was his love, his compassion, his wish to benefit sentient beings. So he was thinking, I, I want to help all sentient beings without exception, even the difficult ones, even the ones who are doing horrible things, not leaving anybody out. I want to help all of them be free of suffering and help them all be happy. And that's why I'm going through all this work, doing all this work, all this hardship. And then becoming a Buddha, you know, he doesn't stop there, but then he continues working for each and every sentient being. Having the same kind of love and compassion for every sentient being that a mother has for her children, or even greater than that, (laughs) even greater than the love a mother has for her children. So Buddha regards all sentient beings like children, like they're very dear, precious children. So Nagarjuna is contemplating that, you know. The Buddha, you know, cherishes and loves every single sentient being. And I respect the Buddha, and therefore, for that reason, I will also feel fond of sentient beings. Shantideva has this as well in his text. He talks about this idea. I don't know which chapter it is. Sixth chapter, I think. And they give the analogy that if you have friends who are a couple and they have children, and if you really like the parents, you know, you you regard them as your dear friends, and you really like them, really care about them, then don't you also care about their children? Because they, they care about their children, they love their children, and if you love them, you should love their children as well. I'm not sure if that always works. <laughs> I was thinking if the children are monsters. <laughs> Has anyone ever had that experience of having difficulty liking your friend's kids? Do you think it helps um, if you do like the parents? You, you, you really like them and you want to be close to them, you want to be friends to them. Doesn't that make it easier to have patience with their kids too? <laughs> yeah, so I think that's the idea here. You know, So if we really care about the Buddha, we really you know, love the Buddha and honor the Buddha, respect the Buddha, and we think, okay, Buddha loves all these people, even these really difficult people like Putin or Trump or, you know, whoever you find difficult, Hitler, Mao, Stalin, you know, people who've just done awful, awful things. So Buddha looks at those people and he feels love, just like a mother for her child. And again, I think it's helpful to remember or to accept other lifetimes and that can help us open up because you know if you look at Putin for example and he's doing all these awful things right now but has he always been Vladimir Putin president is he president or prime minister president President of Russia has he always been that no according to rebirth (laughs) Um, So he's been other beings in his past life. And he must have done some good deeds to be born as a human being. What's the cause of being born as a human being? 
ethical conduct. You can't be, you can't have a human body, you can't have a human life if you don't practice ethical conduct. So just the fact that he's a human being in this lifetime means he must have practiced ethical conduct in a past life. He refrained from killing, refrained from stealing, refrained from lying and all those things. He must have been a good boy or good girl or whatever to create the cause to be born as a human being. And he's wealthy. What's the cause of wealth? Generosity. Generosity. You might say, oh, but he stole his wealth. He he manipulated his position. But, you know, that alone isn't enough, because there's a lot of people who do that, but they still don't end up being wealthy. (laughs) (laughs) So being wealthy, being powerful, you know, he must have created some good karma in past lives. And maybe he was just a wonderful person. Maybe he was a doctor, a very compassionate humanitarian doctor who totally devoted his life to saving others' lives. And it's just incredible. So if you were Buddha, or even if you had clairvoyance the, you know, from Samadhi, you could see that. You could see what he's done, who he's been in previous lives. And yeah, it's very unfortunate that this lifetime, even though he was born as a human being in good conditions, but those nasty afflictions are still there in the mind as long as we're in samsara. We still have those afflictions in our mind and we just never know when they can start coming up and taking over the mind and then causing the mind to just go completely berserk and do these horrible things. Yeah, but the Buddha would be able to see that. He would see the good deeds that person did in previous lives and know that he's not that bad. He's just confused under the control of afflictions and karma and so on. And also the Buddha would see, okay, now he's creating all this bad karma. What's going to happen next? So then compassion, you know, like he's creating all this suffering for himself. So having that awareness of past lives and future lives and samsara and the different realms of existence, you would just feel so much compassion, compassion and love. And also, Buddha is able to see the potential each and every being has within their minds this potential to transform, the potential to be free of all afflictions and karma, all negativity, all obscurations, and become a Buddha, just like he did. I mean, the Buddha himself wasn't always a good boy. You know, they say, <laughs> they say when the Buddha first generated uh, compassion and the wish to become enlightened to help sending beings, he was in hell. So why was he in hell? <laughs> well, they don't talk about that, but he must have done some bad things. So even the Buddha, you know, he was in hell, he did bad stuff, but he managed to emerge from that, to transform himself and reach this wonderful state of enlightenment. So everyone has that potential as well. And the Buddha is able to see this, the bodhisattvas are able to see that too. And so that's why they're able to have forgiveness, compassion, love, and not give up on anybody. Anyway, so those are some... (laughs) thoughts that can help us be more open to others. Okay, the next verse says, in this way, since benefiting and harming are the respective causes of immeasurable happiness and suffering, sentient beings are also my gurus. So we're saying in the first couple of verses are, if we Uh, If we benefit sentient beings, that is the cause of happiness. If we harm sentient beings, that is the cause of suffering. And also in the verses that follow this, which I, I don't put up here, but you can get the text, he goes into more detail about that. Like, you know, if we... If we do harmful things to sentient beings, if we kill them, we beat them, we... You know, cause them physical suffering, we lie to them, cheat them, and so on. So we do negative actions in relation to sentient beings. What will happen? We're creating bad karma, and that bad karma will be the cause for suffering. We find ourselves in unfortunate rebirths, 
experiencing lots of problems and suffering. So harming sentient beings will bring suffering upon myself, will take me further from enlightenment. On the other hand, if we benefit sentient beings, if we're kind to them, and we ref- just refraining from harming, that itself is beneficial, right? Yeah, even if it's hard to help, but at least if we don't harm, <laughs> like the Dalai Lama says, try to help others as much as you can. And if you can't help them, at least don't harm them. So that itself is something beneficial. One of my teachers once said that, um, yeah, if we, if we take the precept to not kill, if we make that commitment, I am not going to kill sentient beings, that itself is a great gift to all sentient beings because it means every single sentient being is safe from us. They, they are protected from us. They can be assured of not being harmed or at least not being killed by us. And that itself is a great gift. Yeah so, um, yeah, so to give up harming sentient beings and trying to help them as much as we can, when we can. So that, doing that, living that way, is the cause of happiness. That's, that's how we create virtue, good karma, that will bring good rebirths in future lives, good situations, good conditions, and progressing along the path and eventually reaching enlightenment. So, and then the last line, uh, sentient beings are also my gurus. I wasn't quite sure what to make of that. <laughs> in, in volume five, the explanation is that um, it's said that in relation to our gurus, our spiritual teachers, they are very powerful objects for creating both virtue and non-virtue. You know, so we can create a vast amount of virtue or merit, good karma in relation to our teachers by making offerings to them and serving them and practicing what they teach and so on. So they are very powerful objects. In fact, the most powerful objects for accumulating virtue or merit. But also they are powerful objects for creating (laughs) non-virtue. So if we lie to them, if we get angry at them, if we steal from them and do any kind of negative action in relation to spiritual teachers, then the karma is particularly heavy. And so so they're quite powerful objects for both accumulating positive energy and also negative um, that we want to avoid. So then in a similar way, sentient beings are also powerful objects in relation to whom uh, we can create a great deal of merit or virtue, good karma, which is the cause of happiness and spiritual growth. But there are also objects in relation to whom we can create a lot of um, non-virtue, and thus the cause of suffering. If we contemplate that and we come to accept that, then it will make us very cautious about trying not to do anything harmful and always trying to do what is helpful, what is beneficial. Because we are creating the causes for our own future experiences in relation to sentient beings. But I also can't help but wonder if the last line could also mean that we can see sentient beings as our gurus in the sense that they are great teachers. Because that that kind of idea comes up as well, that we can learn so much from sentient beings, even when they're being misbehaving. (laughs) We can practice patience. They are great teachers of patience. And of course, generosity, ethical conduct, and so on. So they give us lots of opportunities to practice and grow our good qualities and, and, and learn, just learn a lot from others. So that may be another way of thinking about that. So these are just five verses from that text. Um, and then uh, after these verses, like I say, there's some verses going, kind of elaborating on the idea of what kind of karma we might create in relation to others. If we do non-negative things, harmful things to others, then we will end up with these bad experiences. If we do positive things, virtuous things in relation to other beings, then we'll end up with these positive experiences. So just, yeah. And then, and then he also goes on 
in later verses to talk about how sentient beings help us in our practice of the six perfections, how we need other sentient beings to do those practices. That's a beautiful text. It seems so unfortunate that somebody could go backwards um, in their realms, and I was hoping you could talk a little bit about choice, free will versus karma that, you know, how does somebody, let's just take the Putin example, start um, or, or end up in a, a good a realm that's good enough to become a human or do enough good to become a human and then have power and wealth and um, wouldn't those, don't the good seeds that he's already really nurtured? Yeah, this is what we like to think. <laughs> But I think um, that's part of the tragedy of samsara. That, you know, there are, uh, there are certain lives in which we're in really good conditions and, you know, everything is wonderful, everything is favorable, and we may live a very long life and, and you know, have all kinds of wonderful experiences. But then because with it, we're still in samsara, you know, the meaning of samsara, the real meaning of samsara is... Um, our body-mind combination, aggregates, that are under the control of afflictions and karma. It's not easy to understand. It takes time to understand that. But, you know, it means that we are not free. Our whole body and mind are like pervaded by or under the control of karma and afflictions. There's always karma, the karma from our past lives, much of which is negative karma. So even if we're in a good situation like now, as a human being and, you know, and living in the abbey, but we still have negative karmic seeds that we created in past lives, and even in this life. <clears throat> we did bad stuff, and those karmic seeds are still there. And then, it, and then, you know, it just depends on what kind of circumstances happen. I mean, if some people came up here with harmful intent and, you know, started doing nasty things to us, we might get angry, we might get into fights with them, even kill them, because we have those karmic seeds. We did that kind of thing before, and having done something before means there's the possibility of doing it again if the conditions are there. And also if, I mean, part of the conditions are our own afflictions. If we haven't eliminated our ignorance, our anger, our attachment, I mean, we're trying really hard to get rid of those things, but it's not easy. So they linger on. So as long as there's karma and afflictions, and we're still in samsara, we're not in complete control over things, we could find ourselves in situations that would um, trigger or nurture those kind of karmic seeds, and then we'd find ourselves doing bad stuff, negative stuff, even though it's not what we want to do, but it could happen. Like in Tibet, when the Chinese invaded, um, and were taking over Tibet, I heard and I also saw photos of some of the monks in the monasteries uh, picking up rifles and going off to, you know, kill the Chinese. Some didn't, of course. They said, no way, I'm not going to do that. But even though they were monks, they'd taken vows to not kill. But, well, they probably felt we have to defend our country, we have to defend our monastery, so they engaged in killing. So it's, it's, karma is a very complex <laughs> topic. There's all kinds of different issues and so on and so forth. But, yeah, it's possible that even in good conditions like a human life, intelligent, healthy, good conditions, it's still possible that causes and conditions could trigger off other karmic seeds and we could find ourselves doing awful things. So this could happen to any of us and it's actually good to contemplate that because it can help us to be more humble because if we judge others like Putin, there could be some arrogance there, you know, like, oh, I would never do such a thing. But who knows? <laughs> if we had been born in that situation with, you know, with the conditions that he grew up in, we, we may have ended up like that too. 
We just don't know. And again, like I say, that's the tragedy of samsara. And that's why it isn't enough just to be in a good life, a good situation, have good conditions, but we have to get ourselves out of samsara. We want to get ourselves free of this whole situation, which mainly means free of karma, free of afflictions. And the way to do that, the one and only key (laughs) to freedom is the wisdom realizing emptiness, the true nature of things. That is the one thing that will enable us to free ourselves from a karma and afflictions and samsara. And it's difficult, of course, it's difficult to understand that, but we have to at least try, try to make inroads into that topic. And yeah, so until we've gained that wisdom, realizing emptiness, we just never know what, what could happen to us. Could you explain why the Buddhas don't get lonely? (laughs) Uh, Why the Buddhas don't get lonely? I don't remember hearing any teaching about that, but I mean, why would they get lonely? They got everything. They can do everything. I mean, loneliness, what is loneliness? Why do we feel lonely? Why do we get lonely? And it isn't just about being alone, right? I remember once meeting with a group of women, and they were all like married women, and, I was, and they were asking me questions about being a, a nun. And I said, well, one of the difficulties is loneliness. And one of the women said, well, just you, you can be married and still be lonely. <laughs> so, yeah, I don't have that experience. I never got married. But, yeah, it's possible. Even you could have... You could be married, you could have a bunch of kids, but you could still feel lonely, neglected. You know, they're not paying attention to you. So it isn't just about being alone. And then you could have yogis living up in a cave all by themselves, nobody else around, and they're totally happy. They don't feel lonely at all. So it's really just a mental state. It's where you're at in your mind. If you feel full of love and compassion and joy about doing your dharma practice and working for enlightenment to help all sentient beings, then you're happy wherever you may be. You don't need them right next to you, talking to you, giving you attention, because they're there in your mind. Sentient beings are there in your mind. And um, I think loneliness is egocentric, isn't it? I want attention. I need attention. I need affection. It's good to look at that. What is going on when there is a feeling of loneliness? Buddhists don't have that problem. (laughs) They're no longer, you know, egotistical, self-centered. They're just totally altruistic 100% of the time with every single one of their thoughts and states of mind. They're just totally focused on others, helping others, taking care of others. They don't need anything from others. They're beyond that. I mean, that's how I think of it, because I don't know what it's like to be a Buddha. I can just imagine, try to imagine it. But there's lots of other Buddhas they can hang out with as well, if they do get lonely. (laughs) In fact, I think... You know, they do say, like, in some of the sutras, a Buddha is giving a teaching, and he's surrounded by all these other Buddhas and bodhisattvas and deities, and um, they're there, you know, to support him or listen to him or, or whatever. So I don't know if a Buddha is ever really alone, <laughs> all by themselves. <laughs> How does collective karma work in samsara? How does collective karma work in samsara? There isn't a lot of explanation about that that I have come across. They just mention it and give a few examples. Um, Like, you know, if a group of people is in a situation and they're experiencing common experience, a good one or a bad one, then it's said that um, it's because they were together in previous lives creating similar karma. So when we, together with other people, create karma, like here in the Abbey or at retreats, when you sit together in the morning and do prayers and meditation and generate these positive thoughts and so on, so we're creating collective karma. 
So we have to be sure we're creating good collective karma <laughs> because there's also bad collective karma when you get together with your gang members and you, you know, do some naughty things, get into fights, kill people, steal, and so on. Then you're creating bad negative, bad collective karma. And as a result of that, you could find yourself in a future life with those same people having some bad experience. So it sort of explains how a whole group of people can experience some good experience or bad experience collectively. And, and somebody who didn't create that karma might be with that group, but they didn't create that karma, and then they don't have that result. For example, I remember this amazing story of a, of a, a, of a plane, an airplane that crashed. And there were hundreds of people on the plane, and they all died except one small baby. It was just extraordinary that this little baby, you know, they're so small and fragile that they survived when all the others didn't. So that kind of thing happens. You know, there's an accident, a crash, and many die, but one doesn't. One isn't even injured. So that's that could be an example of collective karma, that the people who died had created some karma together. The one who was un, you know, unharmed hadn't wasn't part of that collective karma. This is more just a comment, but this winter um, I was doing purification on working with my enemy. And instead of doing the trying to see them as my mother, I tried seeing them as my teacher, just like how much I admire Venerable Chodron and you. It's like, oh, if they were my teacher in the past, like, and they're trying to teach me, um, for some reason that was just much more poignant in opening my heart. So that was just a helpful mm. thing. Yeah, I think if you find your own ways of <laughs> working with things, you know, as long as the, the point is to, yeah, have an open heart, kind thoughts, compassionate feelings, the wish to help rather than being angry and so on. So whatever helps you to do that. Yeah, I mean, for some people, thinking about the mother isn't helpful at all. <laughs> but on the other hand, you know, even people, I've met people who had not very nice mothers and um, or mothers who were neglectful, but they still found that meditation helpful to, you know, resolve some of their problems and open their hearts and be more compassionate. I mean, just the fact that our mother gave birth to us, even if she didn't take care of us very well after that, but we, this body is due to her kindness. So she didn't have an abortion. She could have had an abortion. She didn't. So that in itself is something to be thankful for. So we can always find ways of finding kindness, finding benefit in that person's behavior towards us. I was thinking about one of the comments earlier. Um, when we do feel destructive tendencies arise within us, is it the correct approach to think this is certainly the result of causes, conditions, triggering the seeds that are already in me for anger, for violence, for whatever the, the negative emotion is, and then to catch it as soon as possible, apply any antidotes, and then afterwards to apply purification rituals. Is that the right sequence to go about it? Um, yeah, so you're saying if we feel some destructive tendency coming up in us, should, you know, should we recognize that that is something negative and choose not to follow it and use antidotes and then do purification? Yeah. Ah, well, that sounds good. I mean, there's lots of other things you could do as well, like uh, contemplating how other people, lots of other people, have these same um, destructive tendencies, and some of them aren't able to control them. Some don't even um, know how. They have no idea that it's possible to do something about these. And instead, they just totally get into them and follow them and act them out. And so that thinking in that way, it's just something you can add to it that can help you have compassion for others. Because there was one time, I was actually in a retreat, and I had so much anger. <laughs> it was like, yeah, very difficult. A lot of anger coming up. And um, 
it wasn't even particularly towards any specific person or situation. There was nothing around me that was making me angry. It was just coming from inside, deep, deep inside, almost like primal anger. And it was so hard to deal with sometimes. But I remember one day, it was around the time when there was this genocide going on in Rwanda. You know, the Hutus and the Tutsis, huh? Yeah, those two groups of people that were just slaughtering each other with machetes, and it was just awful. And and so I thought, you know, normally when I hear about that kind of thing, I just go, oh, I can't understand how people can be that way. So when I was feeling this anger, then I thought, now I understand. <laughs> I understand how, you know, that kind of anger can come up in your mind, and if you don't know how to control it, you could just act out, those, do those kind of awful things. So it really helped me have more understanding and more compassion for those kind of awful deeds and also compassion that they they didn't know what else to do they they hadn't met the dharma and they hadn't learned antidotes for dealing with their anger and i guess there were also a lot of forces that were fueling the fires and um making them feel justified in what they were doing and yeah and just all oh, the karma they were creating and the suffering they must have felt afterwards you know, thinking back about what they did. So it just really gave me a lot of compassion for people like that. So that's just something else that you can think about if you are able to, that could help, again, open up to kindness and compassion for others and spur your bodhicitta, <laughs> get to enlightenment as quickly as possible to help beings like that. But yeah, it is important to recognize the negativity and um, choose not to go that direction, apply antidotes. And there's lots of different antidotes. So, you know, if you try one and it may not work, try another one. And I was doing that during that retreat. I was trying all these different antidotes, and sometimes one would work better, but not another one. Other time that would work. And So just keep trying different antidotes until you find that's the one that works, or that helps at least. And yeah, purification. As far as um, moms go and stuff, um, I think most of my life, because of the situation, it really, I was quite habituated to feeling that I was a victim of some cruelty, some dif difficulty, some abuse. And then the Dharma has helped me to see, first of all, that it was certainly a ripening of karma in relationship to this particular being. So and you're saying your mom? Yeah. So she passed away when you were born? Right, but this is my stepmom. Yeah, so there are two oh. karmas going in. The mother who oh. died when I was born and then the one who replaced her who was had some issues. Okay. And But for me to be able to see, you know, as a child, we're just so egocentric and that the whole world revolves around us and that we have to have this kind of attention and care. Only many, many decades le later, when I looked back over my life in relationship to her and the things that she did... I suddenly got to understand that that parents come into the, into the your child to bear you in the middle of being under the control of afflictions that are and then their own karma that has nothing to do with you. It may play itself out with you, but the suffering that she was experiencing that was totally had nothing to do with me, but was triggered by circumstances within the dynamic. It changed my entire relationship to her. You know, mm -hmm. all I saw was just the pain that she was able to raise us and care for us in the middle of the type of mental suffering that mm -hmm. she had experienced, that she was habituated to. Mm -hmm. It opened up the whole kind of door. So it's helpful to see, you know, as, as we look at this, this kindness of the mother. I couldn't do it the first 15 years of my Dharma practice until mm -hmm. the Venerable taught about the suffering of parents, this, that what they bring into that relationship with you is another whole thing. Hmm. Yeah, I found that really helpful too. And I don't remember actually coming across it in the Tibetan Buddhist teachings, but um, Louisa Hayes, has anyone heard of Louisa Hayes? <laughs> kind of a new age, um, I don't know, speaker, teacher, healer. Yeah, I came across some material of hers that was really helpful, um, especially just 
it, a kind of a, a meditation where you imagine your mother or your father as a child, a three-year-old child. And that was just mind-blowing. I never thought like that. You know, you, you, we come into the world, they're already adults, and we tend to think, well, they've always been that way. <laughs> Why can't they get their act together? So if you think about your parents as children and what they probably went through in their life with their parents, and, wow, oh, it just really opened my mind. Yeah. They're human beings too. They've been through difficulties too, just in this life. But on top of that, their karma, the karma they brought in from past lives, their afflictions, and so on. They're just human beings. They're not Buddhas. So that was very, very, very helpful to help me heal or resolve my difficulties (laughs) with my parents. And it's so worthwhile. I once, just in the early days of my Dharma path, um, Lama Yeshi said something about how if you have problems with your parents and you don't resolve them, you won't be able to make progress in your spiritual practice. And that was pretty mind-blowing, because at that point in time, I had pretty big problems with my parents. <laughs> they were mainly from my side. But that really gave me a strong impetus to work on my mind and my relationship with my parents. And I'm so grateful for, for the Dharma, the teachings, all the material I've received, and how to resolve those problems. So that, And I'm also grateful my parents lived long enough... <laughs> <laughs> that I could resolve uh, those problems, because that would be awful, you know, if they were to pass away before you managed to apologize for the difficulties you gave them and say, I love you and really mean it. That would be quite painful. So I, I'm glad that I was able to do that. So then you have a kind of open heart and clear conscience with regard, and they are such important people. So even whatever difficulties you have with your parents, it is important to try to work on those those feelings and those relationships and make them as clean, clear as possible. They're still there in your mind. (laughs) I mean, they're always there in your mind. Um, So you can work things out with them. You can write them letters. You can visualize them and talk to them, have conversations with them. So even if they've already gone, you know, you can still, at least for your side, you know, work work on those things and, and make prayers for them wherever they've gone. May they have um, good circumstances. May we meet again and may I, I help you on your path to enlightenment. So, yeah, there's lots of things we can do even if they have passed away already. And not just parents, but anybody else that we may have had difficulties with, a grandparent or a aunt or uncle or sibling or whatever. So it is important to do what we can to resolve those problems, heal those relationships. Well, we only have eight minutes left. Just quickly, I was going to talk about the whole prayer of the four measurables, but we don't have time. I did, last time I taught this course, which was, I think, two years ago, and the Uh, the teachings are online, I did spend more time talking about all four of the immeasurables. So this time we only talked about the first one, loving kindness. Yeah, there's three others that are... (laughs) (laughs) Next time. But loving kindness is really important to be able to have the others, you know, to be able to have compassion. If we can open our hearts and feel kindness concern for others, then it's easier to have compassion for them when they are suffering or when they are in difficulties. And empath- empathic joy. Is it empathic or empathetic? Empathetic? I, I don't know. But anyway, <laughs> that one. Yeah, so just briefly, the first, the first of the four measurables is loving kindness. So that's expressed by that first line of the prayer, which says, may all sentient beings have happiness in its causes. There's a lot more I could say about that as well, like the causes of happiness. What are the causes of happiness? Basically, virtue. So we wish sentient beings not just to be happy, but to create the causes of happiness, to have positive states of mind and do virtue, create virtue 
so that they will ensure their own happiness for a long time to come. So it's important to wish that as well. And then the second line is uh, compassion. May all sentient beings be free of suffering in its causes. So there's a lot to say about that. Um, wishing sentient beings to be free from all the different kinds of sufferings that they have, as well as the causes of suffering, which are afflictions, greed, hatred, ignorance, and so on, and karma, negative karma, negative action. So we want sentient beings to be free of those as well. So they're not creating suffering for themselves. And then the third one is empathic joy or empathetic joy, I'm not sure. Um, May all sentient beings not be separated from sorrowless bliss. So there's different meanings of that. One is just wishing sentient beings to continue to have happiness in all their future lives, to be born in good situations, not hell and animal realm, but have good rebirths and have good conditions, everything they need, and eventually get out of samsara altogether, reach nirvana and enlightenment. So that's one way we can use that. Another way is feeling happy when others are happy. That's that's the mean, meaning of empathic joy. When somebody else is happy, they're having good experiences, good things are happening to them. Instead of being envious, which sometimes happens, you know, we feel jealous and envious and resentful. Why do they have to have that? I want that. Why do they have to have more than me? I want to have more than them. So those kind of thoughts can come up, which are not very nice at all. So instead of that, we learn. We sometimes have to force ourselves to do it, but we try to feel happy for them. I'm so happy that you got that brand new BMW. It's so beautiful. (laughs) I'm so happy you won the lottery or whatever. You got a new boyfriend, new girlfriend. Yeah, whatever it is, feeling happy for them, rejoicing in their good fortune rather than jealousy. So again, the more we cultivate love and kindness, which is wishing others to be happy, then it's easier to rejoice when they are happy rather than being jealous and envious. So that, that one depends on love. The last one is very difficult, equanimity. So this is... I mean, it says wishing all sentient beings to have equanimity, free of bias, attachment, and anger, but we have to develop it ourselves. So that means when, you know, when we're cultivating love and compassion, we need to do so for everybody and not leave anybody out, not have the attitude, I wish all sentient beings to be happy except that one. I wish all sentient beings to be free from suffering except that one. They deserve to suffer. So that doesn't work. (laughs) <laughs> if we want to reach enlightenment especially, we have to not leave anybody out of our compassion, our kindness, our wish to help. So that's the meaning of equanimity, being able to have even-minded, impartial attitudes towards everybody. And that's not easy to do, but it is important to do. It is necessary to do if we want to reach enlightenment. And even to be peaceful in this lifetime, I mean, it's not very pleasant, you know. It's a bit like Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, you know. We're so nice to some people and so nasty to others. So it's like, I mean, is that really the way you want to be? (laughs) Doesn't feel quite right, does it? (laughs) So, yeah, there are ways to work on that, and that's in the teachings on equanimity. Yeah, so we don't have time to go further than just that those brief comments, but you can find more material in books and online teachings and come back for more retreats and <laughs> it's there's a lifetime of work to do um, to learn all these things and practice all these things, but whatever little bit we do is very, very good, very helpful, and we should rejoice. So now that we're at the end, um, we'll 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 do some prayers to dedicate our merit. And it's also, you know, when we do conclude a teaching or a meditation or whatever, it's also good to try to feel a sense of joy in our own 
merit. Um, we, we rejoice in others' merit and good deeds. We also need to rejoice in our own and feel, that was a good thing to do. I'm glad I did that. And, and that gives us encouragement to do more, to keep going, rather than, you know, sometimes, I don't know about you, but at the end of a meditation, I'll feel, oh, that was so lousy. My mind was all over the place. I couldn't concentrate, and I had all these bad thoughts, and I couldn't sit still. It was just like, you know, beating myself up for the lousy job that I did and not feeling very good about the fact that I did, just, just the fact that I did try to meditate. That itself is a good thing to do. So it's really important that we um, acknowledge our efforts, even if we're not perfect. I mean, how can we expect ourselves to be perfect? We're not perfect. So just rejoicing that we do at least try to do good deeds and practice and meditate and so on. And, and give ourselves credit for that, pat ourselves on the back, not with pride or arrogance, but just that was a good thing to do. I'm glad I did that, and I want to keep doing it. I want to do more. I would have that kind of attitude. And with that in mind, then um, we will share the positive energy we've created, um, this, this, this teaching with all other sentient beings who have all been kind to us. You know, we don't remember it, but they have, and (laughs) wish to benefit them in return, especially helping them reach enlightenment.